And tonight, we have the pleasure of having Kaya Sanders, who is a researcher at UCSF, and is a neuroimaging, she's a dyslexia, and she's going to tell us a little more about the neural basis of it. Thank you very much. my heart to see so many brain nerds out in the world. Uh, so I'm really excited to sort of geek out with you for the next hour or so. Uh, thank you so much, Wednesday, for hosting this space. And I feel really lucky to be talking here. Um, so like Dina said, I work in neuroimaging to study schizophrenia. And I'm really particularly interested in how the sense of self changes from schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. That's much better. Okay. Uh, and so before I worked in schizophrenia research, uh, I worked in a meditation lab for about five years, um, where I was sort of approaching the same question from a different angle, sort of studying how the sense of self changes as a result of meditation. So this has really been, the neural basis of the sense of self has really been my driving interest for the last five years or so, and it's been really excited to talk about how all the research I've been doing sort of converges on this topic. Also excited to hear your perspectives on this. Obviously, I'm not going to cover everything about yourself, and I think this is a really unique venue to get an interdisciplinary perspective on what we're talking about. So, yes, so I'm going to be talking about the neural basis of the self. And jumping right in. So, what is the self? So, I have a feeling that most of you have a general understanding of what I'm talking about when I say the self. Um, we all have a very fundamental, um, intuitive feeling of existing as an individual, um, as someone with an identity, uh, as an, an agent who uh, navigates through the world with free will, um, as a subject of experience uh, that belongs to us and not really anyone else. Uh, but which of these components really constitute the self? So there's really no philosophical consensus. Um, and of course, some philosophical traditions, most notably Buddhism, deny the existence of a stable self at all. So when we talk about the neural basis of the self, how would you look to the neural correlates of something if you don't even know what that is, or if you don't even know if it exists at all? So I'm sort of going to be sidestepping a lot of the major philosophical debate about the nature of the self and instead focus on the sense of self. And it's sort of a fine distinction, but this is really the difference between looking for something that might not exist and looking at something that's pretty undeniable. I would say most of us have a pretty strong sense of self. Um, and what's interesting is cognitive neuroscience has actually shown us that there are distinct neural processes involved in constructing a sense of self. And while we experience a cohesive sense of being an individual, there are actually distinct <coughs> processes that contribute to different concepts that, uh, that together is what we call the self. So what I'm actually going to be doing is sort of breaking apart different aspects of what we consider the self. And so I'm sort of going to peel this apart layer by layer uh, starting with our most complex representation of ourselves. Um, and so this is what I'll call the narrative self. And this you can think of as uh, your extended identity through time. This is how you know that you've been the same person your entire life and you will hopefully continue to be that person. And so really quickly, just want to point out this distinction between these three sort of components of the self is somewhat arbitrary. Um, different philosophers or psychologists have, uh, have come up with different distinctions, but uh, each one of these has a specific neural process associated with that, so that's why I'm going to focus on these three different concepts. Um, so beyond the narrative self, um, if you sort of remove the dimension of time from that, I think most of us would still feel that in any given moment, we still have a sense of being a self, and this is very closely linked to are simply having a body, and there are specific brain regions and processes associated with ownership of our body. So I'll talk a little bit about that. 
And then finally, even once you strip away the body, and this is probably the most uh, abstract leap and the most culturally dependent on the sort of Western dualistic mind body division. Um, but I think some of us could assume that if you remove the body, there is maybe some still fundamental sense of existing, of being a subject of experience, of having conscious awareness. Um, so the minimal self is really what you think of as the most fundamental core self. And that's actually where my research in schizophrenia is focusing on right now. That's what it's to. Great. So, uh, so we'll start with the narrative self. So, if I asked one of you who you are, you would probably start by telling me your name and probably giving me some information about yourself. So, where you came from, what you do for a living, things like this. And this isn't necessarily a reflective of some immediate reflection on who you are in any given moment. This is really reliant on your autobiographical memory, your remembering facts, information about yourself. Um, so how do we construct a continuous sense of ourself across time? Um, so as I mentioned, it's closely linked to autobiographical memory, but there are obviously more complicated processes involved with that. So how do we study the narrative self in the brain? So one of the most commonly used tools in cognitive neuroscience is functional magnetic resonance imaging, which many of you might have heard of. Um, so essentially what this is, is a giant magnet that can take pictures of your brain and essentially show what brain regions are active in specific cognitive tasks based on changes in blood flow. Um, so most of the time when you're using fMRI, you would have, so for example, if you wanted to know what brain regions are involved in vision, you would have some sort of visual perception tap, and you can compare what regions of the brain are active um, in, the, in the vision task uh, compared to a baseline where you're not doing this sort of task. But of course, this is a little bit more complicated because you can't really stick someone in the scanner and tell them to be a self and then tell them to stop being a self. Uh, so, of course, you have to design specific tasks that try to get at that question. So one of the simplest forms of that is um, to use self-referential versus other referential tasks where you're actually uh, thinking about yourself and uh, retrieving autobiographical information about yourself. Again, this is the narrative extended version of yourself. Um, so one example of that would be uh, you would have someone on the scanner and give them a trait adjective, like a light, lazy, and then that person would just be asked to uh, decide whether that adjective describes itself. And then you can compare that to a control condition where they'd be asked uh, to reflect on whether that adjective describes something else. And they usually use some distant person, like the President of the United States. Although in that case, that tends to also activate brain regions associated with disgust, fear, crippling. <laughs> <laughs> Despair. So, <laughs> um, but this also works with uh, different modalities. So you can also, for example, show pictures of people's faces and see what parts of the brain uh, respond to pictures of your own face relative to pictures of other people's faces, um, or even specific autobiographical memories such as your childhood home compared to another one in the past. Uh, and so what's interesting is that. Across all these modalities, um, there are certain brain regions that, uh, sorry, so all these studies converge on a certain set of brain regions that are active specifically in self-referential processing across all these different modalities. And so these are collectively known as the cortical midline structures, and that's what I have shown up here. Um, I'm not going to go through what each one of these structures does, because a lot of brain structures do a lot of different things, and it's uh, pretty impossible to tease apart. Uh, but there are two in particular that I wanted to point out. So the medial prefrontal cortex, which is shown up here, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So that's supposedly involved in uh, memory consolidation across various time scales. So
So this plays a really critical role in linking with the time zones and creating, again, that sense of continuous identity across time. Um, and the other uh, region that I wanted to bring up is the posterior cingulate cortex. So this is very densely connected to the hippocampus, which, as you probably know, is a hub of memory. So this plays a really critical role in retrieving autobiographical memory. So that's just two of the main structures in uh, two main cortical midline structures. Uh, but the other reason that I wanted to point these two out is because these are also two hubs of, of two hubs of a very important network, the default moon network, uh, which you may have heard of before. So uh, just a little bit of background about the default moon network. This was actually discovered by accident. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, a lot of uh, fMRI studies, what they'll do is have a certain task condition, so you say a visual task, and they'll compare that to a baseline condition where you're not doing anything, where people are just chilling out in the scan. Um, and so what people assumed initially was that that's, there's not really anything going on, it's just your brain, that's essentially zero, so you can compare anything else to zero. Um, but what happened is they eventually started analyzing that data specifically, and they realized that there are actually certain brain regions whose activity is highly correlated, meaning there are certain brain regions, like the ones shown up here, um, that are active at the same time and then uh, quiet at the same time. And so there are very clearly patterns to what your brain is doing when it's not doing anything at all. Um, so yeah, this is essentially what your brain is doing at rest. Uh, and it's also called the task negative network. Uh, what we realize is that it's anti correlated with other networks that are involved in specific tasks. So it, the default mode network is most, act, most active when um, you're not engaged in any sort of external task and instead you're focused on more internal mode of cognition. So any sort of mind water, wandering or thinking about yourself, um, remembering the past, planning for the future that sort of thing. And uh, one of the main functions this serves is to reinforce and stabilize the sense of self by constantly bringing up autobiographical memories, consolidating that across time, and linking that to you know, future projections of the shelf. What do you get when you're a meditator in meditation? I gotcha. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, one interesting thing, so as I mentioned, there are sort of these dissociable concepts of the self that we can talk about. But if the default mode network, if we're sort of in our default mode all of the time, if we're always constructing a narrative version of ourselves, how would we ever dissociate that from any of the other aspects of the self that we would talk about? So, there's actually a really interesting study um, on changing the default mode network in meditation. And so essentially, the rationale behind the study was they wanted to examine what the momentary experience of the self is like. So get rid of everything going on with the default mode network and just see what your brain is doing as you're processing yourself on a moment-to-moment -moment basis rather than a narrative version. And so what they did was uh, they recruited a group of mindfulness <coughs> meditators who are trained to monitor the moment-to-moment Periods, rather than get caught up in the sort of narrative. So, okay, so essentially what they did is they uh, half the participants uh, completed an eight week course in mindfulness based stress reduction where they learn skills such as uh, monitoring breathing, paying attention to thoughts and emotions, monitoring bodily sensations, and uh, without trying to, without becoming attached to that, sort of letting it arise and pass. I'm sure many of you have experience with meditation, you're familiar with um, non-judgmental awareness that is cultivated on a moment-to-moment basis. Uh, and then in the control group, they have people who have never meditated. So then they put people in the scanner, and they did the same sort of task that I talked about before, the tree as you could pass. Um, so, but they had two different conditions, and in the first condition, the narrative condition,
they ask people to reflect on this particular adjective and whether or not that adjective applied to them in the person. So this again relies on the narrative self, uh, autobiographical memory, remembering certain instances in your life when you might have embodied a certain trait. And then um, in the other task, they had an experiential purpose where, again, you read the adjective to the participant, but instead they're asked to focus on their momentary experience. So how their body responds to hearing that adjective, or what, what thoughts arise. And so they're uh, supposed to just be paying attention moment to moment to what changes arise in response to that adjective. And so, so this actually, um, Shows have some pretty interesting uh, brain patterns. Uh, so, so first of all, uh, the group of people who were trained as in mindfulness meditation, they had stronger activation and deactivation across the board in specific in a specific pattern. So, um, default mode network was largely deactivated, um, particularly the uh, prefrontal cortex, and that's what's shown in blue up at the top. Um, and again, that pattern was, there was a more significant change in meditators compared to non-meditators. Uh, and then on the other hand, so, so sorry, this is the experiential focus. So this is when people are focused on moment to moment instead of narrative focus. And so the default mode network is deactivated and this change is more prominent in meditators. Uh, and it's also activated certain brain regions. Um, so here we have insula, which is involved in interoceptive bodily perception. So feeling your heart beat, your breathing, that sort of thing. Um, and also the secondary somatosensory cortex, which is involved in ex exteroception or perceiving the uh, external world through your body. Um, so what this really shows is that there are two dissociable patterns of self-experience, one based on the narrative self, the self across time, and another based on an immediate sense of self. And it's interesting that these are, that uh, some of the most prominent brain regions that showed activation in response to momentary self-experience are also areas of the brain that are involved in perceiving your body. Uh, which makes sense because I think a lot of us feel as though uh, our body is very important to our sense of self. Uh, we feel grounded in our body, we identify with our body, and we know that all our body parts are ours for the most part. Uh, so, just a quick plug for my favorite brain region, the temporal and the junction. Uh, this brain region was actually involved with uh, processing and distinguishing between information from the external and internal environment. And so, what this essentially does is this is critical for distinguishing between self and other. Uh, and this brain region is interesting to me because this sort of challenges some of the uh, assumptions about the unity of the body and the self, uh, the feeling that our self is grounded in our body. Uh, perhaps most notably is that uh, electrical stimulation to the temporal parietal junction can cause out-of-body experiences, um, and actually seizures in patients with epilepsy that originate in the temporal parietal junction can actually cause the same thing where uh, people feel as though they have detached from their body, they're looking down at their body from a third person perspective. And so clearly, in that moment, the self is not unified with the body. Um, and there are other phenomena that might be related to uh, either damage or dysfunction in the temporal parietal junction, although there's less research on some of these phenomena because they're so rare and difficult to study. Uh, so one example of that is the rubber hand illusion, and you can actually try this at home if you want to. Uh, you can order a rubber hand on Amazon. I have it already. Um, and what you can do is, if you're at a table, you can put your your own hands on one of your own hands on the table, and then the rubber hand is next to you, and have a screen sort of separating that, so you can just see uh, you can see the hand on each of them and have your own hand resting on your lap. And if you have a friend who sort of stroke your, the rubber hand and your own hand at the same time, you can see that it's a rubber hand being stroked. So after a couple minutes, people will actually identify the rubber hand as their own. They'll feel the sense of the body actually take ownership of that rubber hand. So, and this is in 
or you know, different things in healthy control. It's not people with any sort of brain damage. So this just shows that our representation of our body is not as infallible as we think it is. Um, and then sort of the converse of that uh, is a disorder called body integrity and identity disorder. Uh, it's sort of the opposite of the rubber candy illusions where people don't identify certain body parts as their own. Um, so, for instance, they just don't experience their sense of self extending through their arm, for example. And there isn't necessarily a delusional component with that. It's they, they know that their arm is their own, it's just that their sense of self doesn't quite extend through their entire body. Um, and this feeling is so extreme that people will actually go lengths of having their feelings amputated sometimes. And after that happens, people are much happier and feel like they've been freed of this limb that never belongs to them. So essentially this really shows that our physical body, um, we perceive our physical body according to a representation in our brain that doesn't necessarily correspond to what's in the physical world. And that dignity with ourselves is somewhat questionable. So, moving on to our last layer of the self. So, after we get rid of time and after we get rid of our bodies, um, are we left with anything? And I think this might be a big assumption, but I think a lot of us would say yes. Uh, we have still a fundamental sense of being the subject of experience. So, the minimal self is also called the basic or core self in the literature. Uh, you can really think of this as. Um, experience uh, or the feeling of mindness of your subjective experience, knowing that your thoughts, your perceptions all belong to you. And this sense of self is pre-reflective, which means, so the narrative self and the bodily sense of self, both of those involve a sort of subject-object distinction, whereas you can perceive yourself, um, for example, in the narrative self, you can perceive or think of yourself like a past version of yourself, so there's the I perceiving the me, whereas with the bodily self, you can perceive your own body as me, and so there's a certain distinction between I and me, and essentially the minimal self reduces that into just the I, where there is no object of perception, it's just the subject. Uh, and this is also closely linked with the sense of agency and ownership of your own thoughts and perceptions, as I'll get into. So the minimal self, it seems so fundamental, but how would that ever actually break down? But that actually happens in schizophrenia. So most of you are probably familiar with schizophrenia. Um, this is, I work with patients with schizophrenia every day, uh, and actually my conception of schizophrenia has changed a lot uh, in my time working there. There's a lot of stigma attached to that, so um, that could be an entire separate section. But, Anyway, so some of the most uh, prominent symptoms in schizophrenia are delusions and hallucinations. So thinking things that aren't true or seeing, hearing things that aren't there. But there are also other symptoms of schizophrenia um, that suggest that the concept of the minimal self might not be as infallible as we think. So for example, people with schizophrenia often experience thought insertion, which is the feeling that certain thoughts have been placed in their head by some sort of external force. So these thoughts, they don't identify as their own. Um, they might also experience delusions of control, where they feel that their thoughts or, act or actions are controlled by some outside force, as if there's some, as if they're a robot, somebody else is controlling what they're thinking, saying, or doing. Um, and also hearing voices, one of the classical symptoms that you think of in schizophrenia. Uh, so one model of hearing voices sort of suggests that uh, this results in a failure to recognize your internal monologue as your own, um, that for some reason you don't recognize your inner speech and instead of perceiving it as belonging to you, you perceive it as an external voice. So that's actually one of the dominating models of auditory hallucinations in schizophrenia. Uh, and that's actually what we're looking at in the lab I work in. And the specific mechanism that we're examining is called corollary discharge. So this is uh, 
Corollary discharge mechanism is essentially how we predict the sensory consequences of our own actions. So, for example, if you touch your nose, you don't need to dedicate the same amount of smell. No, maybe it's just your nose. You don't need the same amount of cognitive resources or neural resources to process a sensation that arises from yourself as you would from someone else touching your nose. And it would be pretty uh, neurally taxing uh, to have the same amount of surprise generated from your own sensations as what the environment is producing. So essentially what happens is when you send a motor command, so for example, if I send a command to speak, uh, a copy of that command gets sent to sensory cortex. So in this example, it would be sent to the auditory cortex. And what this is essentially doing is telling the auditory cortex that you're going to hear your own voice, like, don't freak out, it's okay, I'm doing this. And so that actually suppresses the neural response to your own voice. And so you can actually measure this uh, in people using EEG, that's what we do in our lab. Uh, so EEG is a bunch of, it's electroencephalogram. So uh, you stick a bunch of electrodes on people and it's measuring the electrical activity in their brain. And what you can do is um, play certain tones or something and to measure the brain's response to a certain stimulus. And most of the time, EEG looks like a lot of circle lines, so what you have to do is average together over many, many trials, and then you can actually quantify how your brain responds to a specific stimulus. So, let's get up on this go. Thank you. All right, so, so this is what happens when you average together all squiggly lines in response to tones. So in this experiment, what we actually did was we had patients with schizophrenia and we compared them with healthy controls. And what we did was we gave them a microphone and we gave them earbuds so that they could actually hear their own voice. And we just had them repeat uh, one syllable into the microphone over and over again. Ah, ah, ah. And we were to record their voice and uh, have two conditions, one where they're listening to themselves in real time, and another condition where they just hear their own voice played back to them. And so you can see in the listening condition, so this is the healthy control of their response to just hearing the voice. So they're not generating that sensation in the moment, so they have a full auditory response to that. And this, uh, this is called the N1, it's uh, essentially the part of the waveform that you can uh, quantify differences between patient populations, for example. So that's really just measuring the magnitude of neural response uh, to stimulus. Uh, so then when patients, or sorry, when healthy controls are speaking, you can see that this response is heavily attenuated because you don't need to be surprised about your own voice. But what's interesting is in patients with schizophrenia, um, the amplitude of response is exactly the same in listening and speaking, meaning they don't recognize their own voice as internally generated. Do you mind if I just take questions from you? Uh, so, so essentially, we can use this to sort of take a conceptual leap and hypothesize that maybe this is the same uh, process that's dysfunctioning in auditory hallucinations that maybe not recognizing your speech is internally generated also applies to not recognizing your thoughts as, in, as internally generated. Uh, and this might sound like kind of a jump, uh, but that is, that is actually one of the predominating models of thought as just understanding it as our most complex motor action. So what are the implications for this? They're, they're pretty significant. Um, so, when we talk about the minimal self, as I mentioned, it seems like our most fundamental self that, um, you know, our experience is our own, our thoughts are our own. Um, but clearly in the case of schizophrenia, that can be broken down. Um, so I just want to leave you with a cheesy little metaphor to kind of illustrate how this might apply to everyone else. So if you think of, if you picture yourself standing on the prow of a sailboat, and you think of your thoughts like little dolphins swimming along beside you, and most of the time they're underwater, there's a lot of subconscious processing that goes on 
And then every now and then they jump into your awareness and you can see them. And this is, you know, this is sort of how our minds work. If you pay attention to what's going on in your internal mental landscape, sometimes you feel as though you're the author of those thoughts, or other times they feel as though they're just emerging. And what's interesting is in this dolphin metaphor, if you're watching from the prow of the boat, that sort of brings up the question of who is that you who's watching your thoughts? Um, and can you identify as your thoughts as well? Can you call both of those things you? Um, so this really, this really brings up the question of whether there is a unitary self at all, even in the most minimal version of ourselves. So that's all I have. I want to kind of leave it there and open up the floor for discussion. Thank you so much.